Sarah comes to us from Argonne National Laboratory. She's presenting on experiments to advance and validate accident progression models for MSRs. Um, Sarah is a chemical engineer in the Chemical and Fuel Cycle Technologies Division at Argonne National Laboratory. I'll be presenting on the tests that we've been conducting at Argonne to support accident progression and mechanistic source term analysis for MSR licensing, which we've been referring to as the molten salt spill tests. Analyses of postulated accidents are required in order for a vendor to obtain a license for a new nuclear reactor from the U.S. NRC. And in general, there's a lack of experimental data on the processes that determine the consequences of postulated molten salt reactor accidents. So the experimental data is needed not only by MSR developers to validate models as part of the licensing process, but it's needed to guide and advance model development as well. And it may even influence the final design of the reactor. So it's important that this experimental data is available early when the reactor design is still flexible. So the, the overarching objective of our testing efforts is to provide the experimental data that's needed to close identified gaps in mechanistic source term and accident progression models. For many MSR concepts, a postulated accident scenario involves a rupture within the primary loop that leads to molten fuel salts spilling onto the reactor containment floor. So that's the accident depicted in the diagram. And that diagram just points out some of the key processes that can occur during a salt spill accident that may have consequences on the fate of radionuclides and also the reactor itself. So we divided the processes into five categories. Um, so they include molten salt spreading on the containment floor and flowing through tubing into a drain tank. There's heat transfer from the salt to its surroundings, interactions between the spilled salt and structural materials by warping and corrosion, the vaporization and condensation of radionuclide species from the salt, and also splatter formation and aerosol generation through various mechanisms. Experimental data are needed on all these processes in order to develop and validate models, and that's the focus of our ongoing testing efforts. For our experimental approach, we're currently conducting modular laboratory scale tests to study processes relevant to a salt spill accident separately. We're approaching the, the testing this way so that we can first develop the methods to study these processes and then also generate data that can be used in individual process models. And then conducting these tests on the processes individually enables the identification of key factors and priorities to be considered for model development and also for larger scale integrated tests, which will likely be needed um, in the future for model validation. So in FY22, we conducted three types of tests. So the first was looking at the heat transfer behavior of molten salt, both as a static pool and on a slope stainless steel catch pan. The second looked at spreading and freezing of molten salt on a slope stainless steel catch pan. And then the third looked at splashing, splatter formation, and aerosol generation from spilled molten salt. In FY22, we conducted tests using eutectic sodium chloride uranium trichloride as our salt composition. And just for comparison, last year, um, which was the first year that we started these tests, we used Flynet. And then we also uh, used salt doped with uh, cesium chloride and cesium iodide as surrogate fission products, um, just for the tests looking at aerosol generation. For the remainder of the presentation, I'll just introduce uh, each of our laboratory scale tests that we conducted during FY22, and then just present some result highlights. The processes that we're investigating, specifically spreading heat transfer behavior of spilled molten salt, are significant to the consequences of molten salt spill accidents. So probably the most obvious reason is that spreading determines the extent of radionuclide bearing molten salt dispersal during and after a spill. But the extent of spreading also determines the surface area of the salt that's in contact with the atmosphere, which is input that's required to model the vaporization rate of radionuclides from a spilled salt pool. The extent of spreading and the heat transfer behavior determine the duration that the surface stays molten, which is relevant to radionuclide vaporization. And it determines the duration that molten salt is in contact with the catch pan, which has implications for catch pan integrity. 
this slide just describes our heat transfer test for a static molten salt pool. So the, the test method was designed to provide temperature measurements to validate a heat transfer model like the one shown in the schematic on the left. In the, the schematic, the catch pan is cylindrical. So that simplifies the model because you only have to track temperature in two directions, radially and along the pool depth. And then the bottom was insulated so that eliminates heat loss from the bottom of the catch pan to the surroundings. And on the right, I'm showing a schematic of the test setup in an argon atmosphere glove box. We used uh, 316 stainless steel beaker as the container in which the salt cooled. And uh, it had inner dimensions of two inches of diameter and a depth of three inches. So we chose those dimensions just to accommodate the limited amount of salt we had to work with this year. And we do have plans to scale up these tests in the future. And we used two. IR cameras to take spatially and temporally resolved temperature measurements, one up top that measured the temperature of the salt surface, and then one on the side that measured the temperature of the beaker wall. And in addition, we had a thermocouple immersed in the salt that measured the salt temperature and thermocouples attached to the underside of the beaker. And then after the test, we measured the depth um, and mass of the frozen salt in the beaker. And then the only variables we tested were beaker wall thickness and bottom thickness. And we consequently varied beaker thermal mask because it's proportional to the wall thickness. Here I'm just showing results from one of our measurements to show how we obtained data that can be used in heat transfer model validation. So these two images are actually videos and they, they show this all surface temperature of FLYNAC on the left and then eutectic NACL UCL3 on the right for comparison. So for both tests, salt was initially 650 degrees C and poured into a room temperature beaker. On the bottom right of the FLYNAC video, that's blocked by a thermocouple holder. So that's what that shadow is. So I can start the videos and then you can just see in both cases, the salt cools fastest near the walls of the beaker and also FLYNAC is much more efficient at retaining heat. So both videos stop when the pixels are all below 400 degrees C and then FlyNEC takes about twice as long to get there. And that is expected behavior because FlyNEC has a much greater heat capacity and heat diffusion on a per gram basis than the chloride salt. That's just one example of the data we're collecting for use in validating heat transfer models uh, for static molten salt pools. Here I'm showing the details of the test apparatus that we use to quantify molten salt spreading on a sloped stainless steel catch pan. So on the left is a schematic of our test setup where we pour molten salt from a crucible onto a stainless steel sheet that's 22 inches long and then slightly tilted at a known angle. And all of our tests are done in an argon atmosphere glove box. And on the right is an image of the test setup in the glove box where you can see the stainless steel sheet, and then also above it, there's an infrared camera and a visible camera that were mounted on a tripod and then films the spreading salt from above. So we take a variety of measurements during the tests, which include a visible and IR video of salt spreading. And then we also use IR video to provide the temperature of the salt surface over time. And we use IR video frames to quantify the leading edge of the salt and the covered area of the salt on the sheet as it spreads. Then we have thermocouples attached to the surface of the sheet to get temperature measurements um, of the sheet surface on, at the top and on the underside. And then we measure the thickness of the frozen salt after spreading in certain locations. And this year we didn't measure the composition of the salt after spreading, but that is a capability that we have. And then the, the variables that we tested this year were just the initial salt temperature, the pour rate, and then the mass of salt that's poured. So this slide provides some information that we gained on the spreading behavior of the eutectic sodium chloride radium trichloride salt by looking at the, the visible and IR video frames that were recorded during spreading. So this is just an example of one test we ran with a mass of 65 grams of salt poured at an initial temperature. 550 degrees C and a catch pen tilt angle of 2.5 degrees. So if you look at the still frames from the IR video, there's a cooler region where the 
the salt first impacts the steel catch pan. So that salt actually appears to freeze on impact and form a sort of dam. And then, then the remaining salt coming out of the crucible has to flow around it as it continues to be poured. And then in this example, the spreading salt actually splits into two streams because of that salt dam, but they, the salt does flow all the way to the end of the catch pan. So the, the spreading is limited by freezing, but it's not entirely hindered by freezing. And then another notable finding was that we consistently observed a really thin millimeter thick crust that formed on the catch pan, and it just left a trail along the flow path. And the, the image on the right is just a, the crust of frozen salt that formed on the catch pan. And we quantify molten salt spreading by using the frames of the IR video, as I mentioned. So they're collected at 30 frames per second, which is pretty good. And because of the emissivities of the salt and the stainless steel sheet, and also the temperatures of those two materials are so different, there's really good contrast between the, the materials in the IR image so that allows for image processing software to identify just the pixels in the image that represent the salt. And then we, we use MATLAB for image processing. This is just an IR video of the eutectic NACL UCL3 salt spreading down a tilted stainless steel sheet. And the background was removed during image processing. So you just see the salt on a red background. And we use this information from the IR video to measure the leading edge versus time and the covered area versus time. And this is just out information that can be directly compared with output from spreading and heat transfer models. And as one example, just I've included the plot on the right to show the correlation between the initial salt temperature and then the total area of the sheet covered by the salt right before the salt touches the end of the catch pan. So that's for six spreading tests that we conducted. Um, and then the trend is showing that salts with lower initial temperatures spread to larger areas. We conducted this to quantify the splatter particles and aerosols that are generated due to molten salt spilling and splashing. And aerosol and splatter formation are significant to the consequences of a molten salt spill accident because they play a, a role in radionuclide dispersal, so the, the source term, and aerosols can remain suspended in the atmosphere for a while, which can increase their chance of escaping the containment layers. And radionuclide bearing aerosols that are within the respirable size range are particularly hazardous to, to human health. So to investigate splatter and aerosol formation due to molten salt spilling, we manually pour salt into a stainless steel box, which is shown in the image. And the box has dimensions of a foot cubed. And the salt is poured into the box through the chimney at the top using crucible tongs. So the salt has a 15 inch drop into the stainless steel catch pan. And I'll just mention all the tests are conducted in an argon atmosphere glove box. So we're, we're actually spilling and splashing salt within a radiological glove box. And we have a visible camera filming the splash from the top of the box. There are coupons hanging on the inside of the catch pan walls to collect splatter to determine its abundant size distribution and composition. We have a bunch of thermocouples there recording the temperature of the containment box atmosphere and also the temperature on, at the underside of the catch pen. And there's a filter connected to a pump which we use to collect aerosol particles suspended in the box atmosphere and then we uh, wash those off the filters and use ICPMS to determine aerosol composition. And finally, we use coupons with adhesive to collect aerosolized particles um, for analysis with uh, SEM EDS. And then this year, we just tested the effect of the initial salt temperature and then the presence of cesium chloride and cesium iodide as surrogate fission products. I included this slide just to show still frames of the salt spilling into the catch pan that were taken by the visible camera position at the top of the box. So they were taken 0.02 seconds after the salt first impacted on the catch pan. And it's just interesting to it orients you to see what it looks like. And um, I'll also point out you can already see little splatter particles forming as the salt impacts on the catch pan floor. 
to collect splatter for analysis, we have these coupons attached to the catchment at two different heights above the, the spill zone. So those are the ones labeled one through six in the image on the left. And then we have one coupon that's uh, placed directly below the filter that samples the aerosol particles floating in the gas stream. Um, that's labeled coupon seven. So we strategically placed that there to try to catch aerosol particles floating in the gas stream so we could look at them using electron microscopy techniques. Quantified splatter generated due to splashing by weight and also using image analysis techniques. So we found that approximately 25% of the spilled salt mass for our tests formed splatter particles and there was no dependence on the initial salt temperature. Also, we, when we looked at the abundance and size distribution of splatter par particles, there was no dependence on initial salt temperature. And then we looked at um, splatter composition after each test and it matched the composition of the bulb salt. Um, so for aerosol analysis, we- Hi, hi Sarah, oh, sorry. Could, could you try to finish up within the next couple of minutes? Thanks. Oh yeah, this is my last result. <laughs> So we collected aerosols on Teflon filters, as I mentioned, and um, we tested both pure eutectic sodium chloride, uranium trichloride, and then that salt up with uh, cesium and iodine at two uh, initial salt temperatures of 650C and 800C. So I'm just showing results for sodium and uranium composition in the pot. So for sodium, um, we had similar amounts of sodium on the control filters as the test filters, so that tells me there's some sodium bearing dust in our blood box atmosphere and the results aren't really conclusive because of that. But for uranium, um, uranium was not detected on the control filters, but was detected on the test filters. And so that, that amount uh, did appear to increase with initial salt um, temperature. And we didn't detect any iodine for any sample. And we did find some small amounts of cesium, but uh, there wasn't a clear trend. And then this slide is just, just a summary of results from last year with Flynac. And so just to note, I won't go over it, but we, we did detect cesium bearing aerosols and there was a clear temperature trend. Took advantage of having the MSTDB TC version two, uh, which has iodine in it. I did some thermodynamic modeling of the two salt compositions we've tested, and we found that the iodine species have much higher vapor pressures above flyneck than the chloride salt, and also this your UCL4 gas is a significant vapor species. So I'll just end by mentioning our plans for next year. We plan to conduct um, integrated process tests at a larger scale, so basically combining our test methods and then measuring processes simultaneously using Flynac doped with surrogate vision products. In the future, we are looking to run tests with more complex salt compositions and environmental conditions, looking at real-time monitoring of gener generated aerosols and then also really scaling up and doing engineering scale tests. I'll mention that everything that I showed is um, presented in a publicly available. So thank you very much for your attention.